Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Raul Mataslavsky. Dr. Mataslavsky is the Laurel Swartz Professor of Oncology at Harvard Medical School and is the scientific co-director at the Mass General Hospital Cancer Center. Dr. Matislavsky has studied sirtuin functions in cancer for many years. He has identified a pathway responsible for tumor growth in 30 to 40% of pancreatic cancer patients, and more recently identified metabolism as a heterogeneous feature of cancer. The Matislavsky lab researches the crosstalk between chromatin dynamics and cellular metabolism, chromatin structure and DNA repair, and aging and metabolism. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you, Gil, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So, Raul, I I know you maybe for uh, 15 years, and uh, I know you, your brother, and uh, uh, definitely uh, you had a very interesting career for moving from uh, Argentina to Israel to uh, Boston and then uh, becoming a professor at uh, MGH. So can you give us a bit of a nice background about uh, uh, what have you done, what drove you to become a scientist, and also your life journey? I think that our audience really like to to know what uh, a, a very successful scientist like you are uh, have done. Uh, to yeah, I'm not sure I would call myself a very successful scientist, but uh, thank you very much for the compliment. So... Yeah, I started my career in, in Argentina. I studied, um, I, I went to medical school. I am from a small town in the north of Argentina called Tucumán, where I did a, 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 went to the University of Tucumán for my medical school. And, and probably halfway through my medical school, it became obvious that I was more interested in, in research than in, in classic standard medicine. I, I will start asking we were very curious. You mentioned my brother. We did the career together. I have a twin brother. We did together medical school. We went together to Israel for PhD and came here together. So uh, already at med school, we were very curious and always asking questions on mechanisms that 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 put our medical professors very nervous because usually in, in medical school, definitely in old school medical schools, in, in like the way we have it in Argentina, they will go for the symptoms, the 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 potential diagnosis and treatments. And, and every time someone will ask, okay, but but why those things? And what's going on with that, that patient will, will be developing this particular uh, symptom? Every time we will ask some more in-depth mechanistic questions, they will, they will be nervous because it's not something that will be explored. So so halfway through the to med, med school, we, we, we said we were interested in doing something more related to research. And we started exploring by the time we finished med school, we went to Buenos Aires for a few months to a molecular biology institute because we had zero experience on even what a pipette was. We said we better start pipetting if we want to apply to to a, to a PhD. And, and we were thinking on where to go for a PhD. The U.S. was almost an, an impossible thing because here you get accepted by the university, not by 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 a researcher. And so it was a very, very competitive coming from, from abroad. But Europe and Israel, actually, they have a system where you apply to the researcher. And if the researcher takes you in their lab, it's much more easier to get into the PhD program. And we applied to a few places in France, Italy, and Israel. Most of the places told us, thank you, you have it. And we have really no, no research background. So for these people, we were very courageous to say, sure, come. So most of the people said very 
politely thank you, but but you need to train more in science. No one completely kicked us out. They said, if you're interested, keep exploring. And several people told us, most of the, this was a time before Zoom and Skype, so we were exchanging emails just started. And most of the people said, no one will accept you without seeing your face face to face in person. So at that time, we had some relatives in Israel. We thought that if we would go half across the ocean to a place where we didn't know anyone, we'd rather be in a place where we have some relatives. And, and Israel is known for very good uh, uh, science, as much as, as France and Italy and other places we were exploring. So we decided to actually, without a, a definitive response, with my brother, we decided to, to, to go to Israel and, and knock on doors. And, and sure enough, again, we didn't have much background, but we had good grades in medical school. So some of the people that interview us took the big leap of faith and saying, we trust that they don't have background, but they can be taught, they can learn. And, and we interview in flu paces and probably a month and a half after we were in Israel, both of us were accepted in two laboratories, accepted into the PhD program of the medical school at the Hebrew University. And, and so we did for six years our PhDs in molecular biology in, in Israel. And after that, I was really lucky to, to, to join the laboratory of a very good immunologist and a very good was a joint mentoring by, by Judith Berman and Howard Cedar, two very prominent investigators in Israel while working, I was working on chromatin already in the immune system. And, and at the end, I was lucky enough that I managed to publish well. And so by the time I applied for postdoctoral position, and at the end of your PhD in Israel, most of the people come to the US for a postdoc. So that was the natural path. I came to the US, I was offered a few places for my postdoc, and I was still doing or thinking on doing immunology and, and, and chromatin. Uh, I arrived to my postdoc with Fred Alt, again, a, a major known HHMI and, and investigator here in Boston, working on, 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 on immune genes and, and chromatin accessibility that I was hoping to continue to work. And when I was in his lab, it was Sir Twins, these proteins called sirtuins were discovered, and and I decided, and, and, and some of them are chromatin regulators. And so I decided to start digging into them with the hope that we will be looking into functions for sirtuins in the immune system. And we made the first knockout animals for all the sirtuins, my, myself with, with other postdocs. And, and we got amazing phenotypes related to to metabolism and, and chromatin, not really on the immune system. Uh, Fred was generous enough to let me keep go working on, on these sirtuins. And, and I would say the rest is history because we really published the first connections of chromatin with metabolism with one of these sirtuins, sir6. And I decided to, when I was uh, published nicely in, in my postdoc, I, I, I got a few offers. We or I was happy here in Boston already, and I got an offer and to join the cancer center in in Mass General in the Mass General Hospital. At that time, we I was doing really very basic understanding of sir two in six biology, so not working on cancer. But the cancer center was again very generous in saying we care about recruiting people doing good science. We you don't need to be working on cancer. And, and I started my lab really to try to understand how sir 2 6 sir 6 work as a chromatin deacetylase. And, 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 and sure enough, I was in, a, in an environment that a lot of what we were doing related to phenotype has been observing cancer cells. So we also decided to look and, and, and several of our projects related to cancer research and and sir 2 6 can tell you later. But that's how I started at 2007 here in in MGH in the Cancer Center as an assistant professor and moved to the ranks and to associate. And now I am, I'm a I've been here for, for 13, 14 years and it's been an, an amazing journey. I enjoying the science that we've been doing uh, uh, in this crosstalk between metabolism and epigenetics. So, so just an anecdote, uh, uh, I done my postdoc uh, at MIT at the same time that Raul done his postdoc at uh, Harvard. And uh, uh, I done my postdoc at uh, Lenny's uh, lab, Lenny Garente lab. 
and uh, we work very hard to produce uh, knockout mice to a specific CIRT, uh, uh, CIRT-1 or CIRT-2. And then Raul came and uh, in, I know, very fast he made the knockout mice to all of them. <laughs> and, and it was very uh, humiliating, let's say, for us that one person made so many knockouts and we couldn't make it to one knockout. Yeah, I will not take credit. This was really the, the environment in, in the lab, the alt lab. Uh, the, the lab was a world-known lab for their gene targeting technology. So you, I wouldn't, say, I will not say it was easy, but I will say it was easier than in other places to make <laughs> knockouts because we really have like a factory established to make knockouts. So when I said which of the sirtuins should I pick at the beginning, we really know which one we should be following. And Fred said, "Well, do all." I said, well, <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, you will manage. And, and, and yeah, I guess I, we managed. We, we made really the seven of them in a relatively short time. So, yeah, yeah. And, and it was actually a good thing because at the beginning we really didn't know. And, and I was, again, through the generosity of Fred, uh, having those resources was an incredible resource to have all this knockout animal for a field that was starting. And, and very early, I was mid through my postdoc and I was already collaborating with, with dozens of laboratories in the world that, that were interested in learning about sirtuin. So it really put me in a very good position when I was starting my lab very young. I was already, and again, Fred, he was not his main focus, sirtuin. He was an immunology. He wanted to do immunology research. We weren't getting major phenotypes on sirtuin. So he said, Raul, this is something that you can take with you. You can work with it. So I started my lab already in a good position because I was already collaborating with a lot of people working on in the Siri Twin field. So, yeah. Awesome. And I know one of the focus areas of your lab, obviously, is these sirtuins, which is a family of signaling proteins. And even though you don't study aging, obviously, there is a role that they play in aging. So I was hoping if you would give us a little bit of background on what the SIR2 family of deacetylase. Yeah, so, so when we started, actually, we knew already from work done mostly in pioneering, work done mostly in Lenny in Linguarentes lab, who started really, I would say, the SIR2 in field, the, grow, the growth of the SIR2 in field. There were already few laboratories working with sirtuins mostly from its transcriptional regulation work and indeed if you it's sir, sir2 that the sirtuins come from sir2 like the original homolog was discovered in yeast as part of a complex that regulates transcriptional silencing sir come from silencing information regulator uh, and it really came out of, of all screens that uh, are clar the clar lab in, in nih and, and others did the Horowitz lab did on, on screening for regulators of silencing and activation of genes. These sirtuins in yeast, this one was a complex of four proteins. One of them was sir2 in yeast, and most all of the mammalian homologs are actually homologs to the sir2. It's the only one conserved in mammals. That's why they were called sirtuins from sir2-like. But they were really originally uh, discovered as, as, as silencing proteins. And the reason they are silencing proteins is because in yeast, sir2 is an yeast on the acetylase. This is an uh, enzymatic activity that remove acetyl group from histones, and by removing acetyl group from histone, you compact chromatin, you silence these the activities on chromatin, particularly transcriptional activation. That's how they were originally discovered. And actually, the, the enzymatic activity, the histone, the acetylase activity, was also discovered in Lenny Guarentes' lab, the work of Shini Mai, when he was in, in Lenny Guarentes and now Shin, it's, it's a world famous for his, his later work, not only on sirtuins, but on, on, on NAD, uh, NAD metabolism. When I started working on, on sirtuins in mammals, we knew very little on the mammalian roles for sirtuins. There are seven homologs, and they evolved to do a lot of things. By the time I started working with sirtuins, the lab of Lenny, which was followed mostly by, by David Sinclair, former postdoc in his lab, already established that in particular organisms, particularly yeast, and conserve roles in, in C. elegans, if you overexpress or activate sirtuins, you will get extension of lifespan. And that's really revolutionized the field. And, and on a very small field that was yeast sirtuins before that, uh, the field exploded because that at the time 
where a lot of people were interested in aging research. And when these proteins were shown that, that they could have roles in aging, they were conserving mammalian cells, the field really exploded. A lot of people became interested in understanding whether indeed in mammalian organisms could ser twins also have roles in aging. I didn't follow that path. I, 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 I thought that there were enough there were a lot of people already working on, on aging, and I thought there was still enough biology to be learned that we didn't know about this is doing in mammals that, that I decided to focus on, on that angle. Remarkably enough, and, and there was, as I said, there are seven homologs in, in, in mammals. Some of them are localized to the mitochondria, some of them in the cytoplasm, some of them in the nucleus. I came from a chromatin background, I said I will try to focus on the sirtuins that are in the nucleus, probably working as chromatin deacetylase. That's how we focus originally on sir 6 from the seven homolog sirtuin sirs or sir 6 is the one that is mostly exclusively localized to the chromatin. And, and I, so I said, let's see what sir 6 does. We generated, as I said, the knockout animals for sir 6 and it came down with, with impressive metabolic phenotype. These animals die from hypoglycemia few weeks after they are born. And when I was still a poster, we published the original paper describing the phenotype that the animals, you remove this chromatin factor, they go on to, to develop this severe metabolic abnormality where they die from hypoglycemia. We, we found also some phenotype related to DNA repair. We thought that CIR2 in 6 could have roles in genomic integrity. We published the phenotype. We knew very little on how or why CIR6 were doing those things. And when I started my own laboratory at, at Mass General, I, I decided to follow that, try to understand mechanistically or molecularly what CIR6 was doing. And I can tell you later what, what we found on, on CIR6. Interesting enough, from the seven homologs, after a few years of many people working on this, there are two CIR2 in, in mammals that have shown clear extension of lifespan phenotypes when you overexpress them in, in transgenic models. One is CIR6 itself, and this was rewarding to see because I was not working on aging, but since that, that indeed a transgenic animal for CIR2 extension of lifespan was interesting. And, and another one is CIR1 with work from originally from Shinima itself that published a brain-specific transgenic for CIR2-1 that shows extension of lifespan. So as I said, we kept working on CIR2 in sinks on many, many roles, particularly in relation to cancer, this phenotype of metabolic changes that CIR6 regulate, and I will tell you more in, in a minute, have major roles in, in cancer. We know that CIR6 is a major tumor suppressor, and I will tell you more about it. But interesting enough, other people that kept working on CIR6 from the aging uh, perspective show very unique phenotype for CIR6. There are a couple of papers upcoming in Drosophila that confirm the roles for CIR6 in C. elegans, uh, that, that when you overexpress to transgenic flies, show extension of lifespan. And a very elegant work from Vera Gorgunova in, in mice, uh, and not in mice, I'm sorry, in murine species. So in, this was a comparative, evolutionary comparative study that came out in cell where she compared murine species that live between two years to 30 years from the more extreme case of, of mice compared to the naked mole rat that can live to 30 years and, and 10 other in between. The main thing that she identified in these animals as a unique correlated with with, with longer lifespan was activity of CIR6. She showed that those animals, murine animals that live longer have more activity of CIR6, particularly in relations to enhance uh, DNA repair capacity. I mentioned that CIR6, and we published a couple of papers also on this, that CIR6 has role in, in maintaining genomic stability, in protecting against DNA damage. And in her paper, she showed that those animals that live longer carry mutations in CIR6 that make CIR6 more active and, and more capable of repairing DNA. So the whole theory of, of DNA repair in aging, she showed nicely that that may correlate with, with increased CIR6 activity. So as I said, we don't work on CIR6 and aging, but definitely there are studies out there that, that suggest that CIR6 may have roles in, in aging because of its, its ability to, to protect against uh, genomic instability. 
So, so Raul, we uh, interviewed uh, Vera and also Chaim Cohen uh, about CRT6 and uh, about uh, both of the work. So uh, we heard a lot about uh, CRT6 and aging, and it looks like uh, uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, target for future research and understanding uh, about our uh, lifespan. But we would like maybe now to focus on uh, uh, a CRT6 uh, knockout and transgenic mice, and why, uh, in your opinion, the knockout mice are uh, uh, dying early and why the transgenic are living longer. If you can uh, give us some uh, of your wisdom about that. So I can tell you about the knockout and why they die, why they die uh, uh, earlier. This we, we figured it out in a series of, of experiments. So the main phenotype that this animal develop is actually this fatal hypoglycemia, which at the beginning for, for us was a challenging path to follow. My lab was not working on metabolism when we started and, and understanding why a chromatin factor, uh, the lack of a chromatin factor end up with a, with a metabolic phenotype was not straightforward to, to think about. But, but we went slowly, step by step, going from the chromatin side to, to get into the metabolic one. We knew that C6 was, as a chromatin factor, uh, potentially working as a chromatin the acetylase. We, we, we hypothesized no based on the roles for the yeast homologue. We went on to prove that in this series six, and this was our own work together with the work of other colleagues in the field, Catherine Chua and, and, and David Lombard, that we showed that, that actually series six has clear yeast on the acetylase activity. And I think Gil, you published very early work you were, you were still in Lenny, suggesting that beyond its DNA, it, it, on the acetylase activity, CRC could be also working as on a secondary activity as an ADP ribosyl transferase. Because as all the other CIR2 and CIR6 use NAD as a cofactor, this NAD is this major nodal metabolite, and all the CIR2 require NAD as a cofactor, the way that the acetylase reaction happens is that you take the NAD, you separate it into ADP ribose and into nicotinamide, and the ADP ribose can serve as an acceptor for the acetate that you remove from, from histones in the case of uh, histone deacetylation. And so uh, we, we, we and, and others published this very strong histone deacetylase activity, and we decided to follow this first because if you uh, they acetylate histone, this is a mark to repress transcription of genes. So we thought if C6 is sitting on chromatin, it's the acetylating histone, it may be affecting the expression of metabolic genes that could explain why these animals develop hypoglycemia. Now, this was a big leap. We're talking about expression of genes and we're talking about an organismal phenotype of hypoglycemia. But I won't bore you with the four years that went into trying to understand these two links. I will summarize by saying what we found is that CIR6 regulate what is called a glycolytic switch. So in normal cells, most of the glucose that enter the cells is converted into pyruvate, and the cells will use this pyruvate in the mitochondria for mitochondrial respiration. Okay, My, pyruvate enter the TCA cycle, and you end up producing ATP. It's the most efficient way to produce ATP by oxidizing intermediates in the TCA cycle. So from one molecule of glucose, you end up with 32 to 34 molecules of ATP. That's why we evolved to have mitochondrial in our cells. If cells are experiencing stress, namely, you don't have enough oxygen to maintain the TCA cycle, uh, available, or, or you don't have enough nutrients, so glucose levels drop down, the cells goes into what is called a glycolytic switch. This pyruvate, instead of entering the mitochondria, the pyruvate goes sideways to the cytoplasm, and it's used actually to produce lactate. And, and that's what your muscle will do when you are running, running, running. Your muscles start getting into an hypoxic environment, so you don't have enough oxygen to maintain the TCA cycle. You start producing lactate. And when you accumulate lactic acid or lactate, that's what causes the cramps in your, in your muscle. Uh, so this is a stress response. And that's what cells will do if you don't have enough oxygen. Of course, this is a stress response. This is not something you want to maintain long term, but that gives the cells an opportunity to survive until conditions improve. Long story short, a lot of this, this glycolytic switch is controlled by a lot of 
uh, genes that are activated and silenced throughout this process. What we identified was that CIR6, as an histon de acetylase, was a key modulator of this glycolytic switch at the level of gene expression. CIR6 was in normal cells that sends pyruvate to the mitochondria. CIR6 was repressing the expression of key glycolytic enzymes. So you are able to send pyruvate to the mitochondria. I don't know how far you want to go in detail, but among these enzymes, we have pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, for instance. This is an enzyme that is usually repressed when you need to go into a stress mode and start making lactate from pyruvate. You CIR6 is kicked out from chromatin. You now activate, you acetylate histones, upregulate expression of many enzymes, among them pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, Pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase will phosphorylate, it's a kinase, it will phosphorylate pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is the main enzyme that put pyruvate into the mitochondria. And actually we found few other enzymes that were clearly regulated, repressed by CIR6. So what we identify is, is as CIR6 as a key chromatin or epigenetic modulator of a metabolic switch. At that time, this was big news because the, the, the link between chromatin and metabolism was not established. And our paper was one of the first to show that actually cells modulate the metabolic response by triggering a chromatin adaptation. That was quite unique at that time. And I say at that time, because now a lot of people are working on this relationship between chromatin modifications and metabolic adaptations. At that time, this was one of the first example of this link and, and that we published long ago when we identify this unique metabolic adaptation where cells start producing lactate from pyruvate because you don't have enough oxygen or glucose, we realized that in our cells, the way we did this, we were working with, with CIR6 deficient cells, right? We generated the knockout mice, they die from hypoglycemia. We generated in vitro cells that didn't have CIR6. The moment we removed CIR6, they were starting to produce lactate. Constitutively, you don't have CIR6, you have regulated expression of these glycolytic genes, the cells started producing lactate. What we realized was that by removing this chromatin factor, they were constitutively in this glycolytic switch, even in normal oxygen conditions. This is called in the field aerobic glycolysis. Okay, normally cells will produce lactate under conditions of fermentation. This is the, what is called the Pasteur effect. You don't have enough oxygen you go into a fermentation step where you will generate either lactic acid or alcohol. That's how you generate alcohol from, from, from yeast. You remove oxygen, the cells start fermenting. Or opposing to fermentation, there is a phenomenon called aerobic glycolysis. Even in the presence of oxygen, you still prefer to produce lactate. And that has been described originally by Otto Warburg. He was a German scientist working in cancer and he said cancer cells, even in the presence of oxygen, they prefer to produce lactate. I don't know why, he didn't know why. And for 60 years, we didn't know why cells, cancer cells prefer to do warbur. And so I don't know if you want me to go into this with details, but we were the first to show that this was actually a regulated, when we have our original results with CIR6, where we remove CIR6 and normal cells start doing aerobic glycolysis, the next obvious question for us was, if this is something that CIR6 regulates, maybe cancer cells get rid of CIR6 to acquire this glycolytic adaptation. In other words, maybe CIR6 evolved to be a tumor suppressor because it's putting a break uh, in those glycolytic genes. So cancer cells need to get rid of this CIR6 tumor suppressor mm -hmm. to acquire the Warburg effect. So, so, so this is this is the case, and that's why we started working on cancer. We developed a few models where we show clearly that CIR6 acts as a tumor suppressor by controlling the Warburg effect. So, so, so Raul, uh, uh, talking about cancer, and uh, it sounds like you went to cancer not because you were accepted to a, a department of uh, cancer research, but because you really had a, a, a real story, which is, uh, which is better. So in that case, have you seen or uh, would you expect to see some mutation in a, a CIR-6 that uh, cause a, a, a cancer? Or there is a different kind of regulation of CIR-6 that basically 
allow cancer cells to grow faster by inactivating CIRT6? What is the reality there? Yes, Gil, this is an excellent question. And actually, when we started looking, of course, we went to the TCGA, the, the Cancer Genome Database, to say, okay, if in our models we are seeing an effect for CIRT6 deficiency in cancer, there should be some data out there from the cancer databases that show either mutations or, or downregulation of CIRT6. And what we found were mostly downregulation at the level of expression in many, many cancer types we see that CIR6, by, by looking at RNA levels, is downregulated, meaning cancer cells somehow, and we believe this is epigenetically regulated, downregulate CIR6 to acquire this glycolytic phenotype. Now, of course, every time I would present in a meeting these results, someone, that geneticists mostly, will say, yeah, if a gene is not mutated, I don't really believe that it's a tumor suppressor. You have to have some cancers where the, the way they, they they select for for the lack of this activity of this protein has to be through mutation. So we went back. We needed to convince reviewers, and indeed, by looking carefully in, in the database, we found few mutations in few in few cancers. Were definitely much less compared to to silencing by 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 by, by expression. But we mimic those mutations. At that time, we found eight mutations that were really low compared to other tumor suppressors that are that are inactivated by pom mutations. But we mimicked each one of those eight and we showed that each one of those mutations indeed inactivated or or, or destabilized CIR6, indicating that that these were actually mutations that are evolutionarily selected for in these cancers. We published a short cell report paper on that long ago and i can tell you we've been following the field and and more and more mutations are identified every year and i think now if you look in the in dtcga there are uh, about 300 mutations identified throughout the cir6 uh, sequence in in cancer so i do believe that that tumors some tumors do inactivate cir6 by point mutation but in most of the tumors that we find it's it's, it's mainly through through silencing by of of, of expression of cir6 Cool. And, and ju- just for our audience, I want to explain what is tumor suppressor and what is oncogene. So tumor suppressor is a, basically a protein that usually uh, active, and then the a cancer disactivate it in order to grow. So that's why it's called tumor suppressor. When it's active, it suppresses the tumor. And oncogene is a, a protein that uh, usually it's a, a, a active in a low level, and then the cancer uh, make it to be hyperactive, to allow it to grow. So it's become a, a super protein or super active and allow the cancer to grow. And uh, it's very interesting that longevity gene like CRT6 is uh, actually connected to cancer. So uh, kind of the flip of that about DNA repair, are there any connections between sirtuins and DNA repair or a role that they play there? Absolutely. And, and related to the last point that, that, that Gil made, so... so... There was a famous article, a review article on cancer that came a few years back, published by Weinberg and Hanahan, called The Hallmarks of Cancer. And it, I said it was famous because they really summarize in a beautiful way what were, are considered. If you have to summarize, what are the main things that the cell needs to do to, to be converted into a cancer? What the cancer needs to do to be, to be able to grow? And they summarize this into what they call hallmarks of cancer. Few years after, a group of scientists published what was called the hallmarks of aging. Again, summarizing what are considered hallmarks of aging. And not surprisingly, many of those overlap. And so, so again, cancer is one of the main things that, that grows with age. The, the chances of us to develop cancer it's one of the most strongest correlations that exist for aging. So it's not surprising that many of the mechanisms that protect us from cancer will make you live longer. One of those is clearly genomic uh, stability or, or, or genomic integrity. So you mentioned DNA repair, and we know now that uh, any mechanism that protects ourselves from, from the deleterious effects of DNA damage or DNA breaks will be mechanism that will, will be protecting us against cancer because you will be reducing the chances of developing deleterious mutations. And at the same time, any mechanism that, that protects you against genomic instability will likely 
confer you with longer lifespan because of the many deleterious effects of, of having DNA uh, damage. There, there, is, there are many theories of the DNA repair theory of aging. Why? You accumulate less mutations, so your cells are happier or more fit. You don't exhaust your stem cells. There is a, many theories that, that we live longer because we keep our pool of stem cells for longer period of times. And if those stem cells don't accumulate mutation, you will have longer, happier stem cells, etc. So there are many reasons why keeping your DNA from mutations will, will make you live longer, will make you develop less cancer. In that context, there are many, many papers on roles for sirtuins in DNA repair. We published for CIR6 actually a, a paper long ago in 2013 and uh, showing that it was clear that CIR6 have the capability to move to places where cells were experiencing DNA damage. And you can follow this with, with fluorescent reporters. So we have the ability to make in cells breaks in DNA that you can follow visually. And, and we've proved that CIR6 moves from wherever it's sitting in chromatin, in seconds, it moved to sites of DNA breaks. And in one of the papers we published, we showed that it moves there to bring with it other chromatin factors that were important to open chromatin around the DNA break. And by open chromatin around the DNA break allows for repair factors to come more efficiently. We published this many years ago, and many people actually published in parallel other, other roles for C6 in DNA damage and DNA repair. Vera Gorbunova is one of them that she's been, act been publishing very proactively on, on roles for C6 in DNA repair in different contexts. And, and uh, there are several other papers for CIRT1 and roles in genomic integrity that uh, David Sinclair published long ago and other people have followed on the ability of CIRT1 to move to sites of breaks and also promote uh, uh, DNA repair. And actually, broader, we don't need to talk about sirtuins. There are many, many papers about chromatin accessibility in general in DNA repair. And we know that it's a critical step that for, for factors to come and repair DNA damage, you need to be able to modulate chromatin accessibility and many, many factors has been um, linked to the ability of the cells to repair DNA. And if you can repair better DNA, you will be protecting both in parallel against cancer and, and, and likely you will be able to live longer. And, and not surprisingly, many of the progeroid syndromes, human progeroid syndromes of, of uh, in families where the people develop accelerated aging are, are families with mutations in DNA repair factors. So you have cocaine syndrome, you have Fanconi anemia patients that, that uh, develop progeroid syndromes and they have actually mutations in DNA repair factors like cocaine repair factors and, and, and Fanconi anemia genes. Interesting. And how about any connection between sirtuins or chromatin and telomere maintenance? Again, so so there is very active research on on, on telomere length, and and we know that for, from works from many many laboratories that cells that manage to maintain a healthy length of their telomeres, these are cells that will live longer, and and if your telomere is shortening, you end up with a checkpoint response, and those cells end up being undergoing cellular senescence and arrest. So if you can keep your telomeres long your cells will be happier. It is a double-edged sword because cancer cells tend to activate mechanisms to, to maintain its, their telomeres long so they can mm -hmm. bypass cellular senescence. So uh, you have to be very careful. There have been many companies actually developing uh, um, drugs to, to, to maintain the length of the telomeres longer for, for health health span or lifespan purposes, but it could be a double-edged sword because you will maybe end up also promoting cancer if, if those uh, lengthening of the telomeres happen in, in transformed cells. Uh, sirtuins has been shown to have roles in, in telomere maintenance and there has been a very nice paper by Catherine Chua actually showing that CIR6 moves to, to telomeres and, and actually regulate a unique 
mark in, in histones that is different from the classic deacetylase activity for CIR6. We know that the main deacetylation function for CIR6 is on, on K9 and K56, and she showed that during S phase, particularly CIR6 regulate K9 deacetylation in telomeres, uh, and, and if you remove CIR6, those telomeres will be shortened. And she published a follow-up paper on CIR7. CIR7 is the closest family homologue to CIR6, and she showed very similar functions for CIR7, but in the case of CIR7 and telomeres, she showed it actually that the role of CIR7 in telomeres maintenance related to its ability to bring to telomeres a chromatin a factor called SNF2H, the same factor we show for CIR6 that is anchored to, to, to DNA breaks for its ability to open and close chromatin. So Katrin elegant experiment showed that, that CIR7 has roles in telomeres by bringing this chromatin factor opening chromatin and allowing telomeres to be to be maintained so so it avoids a, a genomic instability in in the context of telomeres so i would say it's, it's one extra angle i wouldn't say that the main main regulators of telomere lengths are cir twins but definitely they contribute to maintaining healthy telomeres in normal cells so Raul, that's uh, really fascinating and the next question is about uh, stem cells so I, I've, I heard a lot about uh, CLT6 and uh, stem cells uh, maintenance and uh, differentiation. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, this was again another study we published and, and there have been many, many others. I will just refer to our study because that's the one I have more uh, fresh in my mind, but there has been many papers on CIR twins and stem cells. We published a few years back. Niston, the acetylase, it caused repression of genes and and one of the models we'll be using in our lab because I came from a laboratory that worked em with embryonic stem cells a lot. We used to grow embryonic stem cells to make uh, knockout mice. That's what you start with. You, you make your embryonic stem cells heterozygous for your gene, and then you make mice from these embryonic stem cells. Since we've been growing embryonic stem cells in the lab, when one was one of the tools that we developed, we, we developed homozygous CIR6 knockout ES cells as, as another tool in the lab to understand molecularly what CIR6 was doing. In doing so, by creating those homozygous CIR6 knockout ES cells, we realized that the ES cells, when we deleted CIR6 completely, we were not happy. Um, so we decided to investigate in the context of stem cells, does the presence of CIR6 is important for for maintaining stemness in, in these cells. And, and what we show, what we, we found, and this came out from a combination of different experiments, that by that time we developed very good antibodies to cheap, this is called chromatin immunoprecipitation. You can, you can immunoprecipitate CIR6, the, the enzyme itself, and see where in the genome, in the whole genome, CIR6 is sitting, controlling expression of genes. Okay, I told you that we, we for metabolism, we found that CIR6 is able to repress expression of glycolytic genes, but we wanted to know, since we have that tool, it's really 10, 20, 100 genes that CIR6 is sitting on and repressing, or are we talking about 1,500 genes from the 15,000 genes that we have in our genome? And, and by then, we developed tools to, to understand that. And when we did this experiment, trying to figure out where CIR6 in the genome was sitting, we saw that it was clear that besides repressing metabolic or glycolytic genes, we saw CIR6 sitting on, on pluripotent genes. Those are genes that maintain stem cells in its stem cell phenotype. Okay, for stem cells to remain stem cells, particularly this, what is called embryonic stem cells, these are the most pluripotent stem cells that exist. These are the early stem cells from where the other cells will differentiate and grow. We found that CIR6 sits and repress expression of pluripotent genes. So what we identify is that when you, when embryonic stem cells start differentiating into the different lineage, keeping CIR6 for, to repress these pluripotent genes was critical. For, for these cells to be able to differentiate into normal, the different normal cell types. And we found that when you remove CIR6, the ability of these stem cells to go into the different pathways were, was compromised. So we, we identify CIR6 as, as an important modulator of early stem cell differentiation. And, and I 
prefer the, the audience to go and, and read if they want to learn more details on, 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 on that activity, 406. So, so Raul, um, we are really interest, uh, interested, and I think that our audience uh, is interested in uh, metabolic diseases. And uh, I think that there is also a lot of uh, interesting uh, knowledge about CRT6 and uh, metabolism. So can you elaborate on that? Yes, so so you and you're probably asking about the connection to NAD as one of the first focus. As I mentioned, all the sirtuins use this cofactor called NAD as a, as a cofactor for their enzymatic activity. And there has been a lot, a lot of research in recent years for what is called the NAD world, where this clear data supporting a very solid data showing that actually with age levels of, of NAD, both intracellular and circulating NAD, decrease with age. And so there is more and more models suggesting that if we can maintain NAD levels in our cells, we should be able to keep our cells happier um, and, and the organism healthier. And many, many laboratories has been investigating the mechanisms of NAD production, NAD synthesis, with beautiful work from many, many laboratories in, in, in trying to understand how you can either bring precursors of NAD into cells or synthesize more NAD from different pathways. Since your twins use NAD as a cofactor, part of this experiment that has been done relates to the lower levels of NAD do affect activity of CIR6, and it's really the decreased activity of the different CIR twins that is causing organismal aging, or is just one from many, many different things that NAD does. So if you ask me, I would say it's definitely one from many. I don't think that today the field will, will be very central in saying it's only CIR twins that are downstream of NAD that are important. We know that NAD as a metabolite has many, many functions. And, and and probably trying to maintain NAD in organisms will be critical, not only to maintain sirtuin activity, but for a lot of other activities that, that uh, NAD participate on. Mitochondrial metabolisms, NAD is a central metabolite in, in, in mitochondrial uh, uh, metabolism. And so maintaining healthy levels of NAD for normal mitochondrial function is critical. A DNA repair enzyme called PARP, requires NAD for its function. So we know that maintaining healthy levels of NAD is critical for PARP activity. And, and the audience probably is familiar with PARP because it's a protein that we target in, in breast cancer with some of the, in the, the, the patients that have mutations in the BRCA genes. They, they tend to respond uniquely to inhibitor of this DNA repair enzyme. So the field is the these days, we believe that maintaining healthy levels of NAD is critical, not only for sirtuin activities, for, but, but also for a lot of other functions where NAD metabolism is important. In the context of CIR6 specifically, it's unique because from among the seven homologs, the seven mammalian sirtuins, is the one that binds to NAD with the highest affinity. This was work done by John Denu many years ago, where he showed that among the seven sirtuins, the ability of CIR6 to bind to NAD is so high that even very low levels of NAD in the cell was enough to maintain uh, a CIR6 activity. So there has been actually a very hot topic of discussion in meetings, different from other CIR2 ins. Does, does CIR6 care about NAD levels? Because if you look at the normal fluctuations of NAD within the cells, even with the lower levels that is physiologically available in cells, the argument is these days that even those low levels of CIR6 will be more than, uh, of NAD will be more uh, than enough to maintain CIR2 in active, CIR6 activity. Interestingly, follow-up experiments by 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 uh, John Denu that was based on some unique experiment that Henning Ling, he's an investigator in Cornell, that found additional enzymatic activity for CIR2 ins. We now know that mammalian CIR2 ins not only do chromatin histone deacetylase activity, several CIR2 ins evolve what we call protein deacylase activity. They can not only remove acetyl groups, but they can remove other chemical modifications that are called acylations. And you have their propionylation, succinylation, 
palmitoylation. These are other chemical modifications that protein can have. And sir 2 in particular in the mitochondria evolve the ability to remove those modifications as well. Henning Ling published this additional activity also on sir 6 and, and John Denu, based on these findings, decided one of these modifications were actually fatty acids modifications. And, and, and using this, this data, John Denu went on to prove that actually CIR6 activity was influenced by free fatty acids. Hmm. Availability of free fatty acid in the cell, because of the ability of these fatty acids to bind CIR6, influence the histone deacetylase activity of CIR6. And we've been collaborating with John to prove whether this was true in vivo. And this will have major consequences because, as, as I was mentioning, the glycolytic response that you have when you inactivate CIR6. If you have fatty acids as a source of energy, you don't need as much glucose. So excess of fatty acid will bind CIR6. You will have less, more activity of CIR6. You have less glycolysis. And it will make sense because you don't need glycolysis or glucose if you have fatty acids as a source of energy. Conversely, on those cells where you don't have enough fatty acids as a source of energy, inactivating CIR6 will allow for better utilization of glucose. Uh, so we've been for a few years collaborating with John, trying to prove that such a system where availability of fat against glucose will depend on the ability of CIR6 to regulate the energy utilization and, and how much normal cells care about this, this activity. Uh, so, Raul, Raul, I'm trying to understand. So it's uh, fascinating. So if you have more uh, uh, fat as an uh, uh, energy source, uh, it's basically will uh, activate CIRT6 or inib- inactivate CIRT6? Activate. You will yeah. activate CIRT6 and activating CIRT6 will repress yeah. glycolytic metabolism. So, so that means that if we are thinking about cancer, more fat, if you consume more fat, you basically will might have less cancer. That's correct? No, because you will inactivate CIRT6 and that is a tumor suppressor, you may have more cancer. And actually we know, independent of CIRT6, that having more fat, there are many uh, laboratories studying the role of fat in, in cancer and, and the, the ability to, to activate fatty acid synthase. And so many laboratories work on the role of fatty acid synthase. It's an enzyme that, that produces fat and allows the cancer cells to utilize fat as a source of energy. And, and so if you have more fat, you will inactivate CIR6, so both having more fat to be used as an energy resource and inactivated CIR6 that will push warbur, those two combined could be actually bad for you because you may have more, more cancer. And actually, as a parallel thing, calorie restriction where you are basically decreasing the availability of not only carbohydrate, but fat also as a source of energy, it has a lot of beneficial effects in the context of cancer as well, not only in, in lifespan, but, but a lot of the original experiments that were done with regards to calorie restriction relates to cancer more than, than to aging. And, and we know that that is it's clear effects for calorie restriction on, on, on protecting against cancer. And, and that could be uh, because of the, the ability to, to reduce a, a fat and carbohydrate availability in, in cancer cells. Makes sense. So, so what you are saying, eat less fat, you will activate CIRT6, you will live longer and have less cancer. You, you, you nail it. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Good summary. Are there any lifestyle factors similar to that, like exercise, sleep, that contribute to CIRT6? How fat so, I would say, I would say regardless of, of, of CIRT6, people always ask me, if tomorrow you will be able to get a magic pill to, to live longer, which will be the magic pill. And I will say the magic pill is, is get out of the coach and, and exercise more. I still believe that this is more universal than anything else. The, 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 the health benefits of exercising are, are, are universally accepted. And, and, and molecularly wise that, I can give you many, many reasons why exercising is, is, is a healthier. And not surprisingly, there are several papers on CIR2 inactivity being enhanced in the context of, of exercise. And many laboratories have been working on, on the effect of exercise on CIR2 inactivity, particularly in, in skeletal muscle and in, in uh, the ability to convert 
white adipose tissue in, in brown adipose tissue, which is healthier in in in, uh, in, in our organism. So definitely the, the magic pill for me still is, is, is exercise first. Diet or nutrition styles. Uh, I don't think anyone doubt, doubt these days that the current current way we eat, particularly in, in, in developed uh, countries, it's, it's, it's actually the wrong wrong way to eat. We, we have too much uh, carbohydrate in excess, in processed carbohydrate in our diet, that there is no real reason to have. As, as human beings, we are able to use fat as a source of energy much more than carbohydrate. So the, the obesity pandemic these days, it clearly has a, a direct link with the excess of carbohydrate that we have in our diet. So any diet that have low or non-carbohydrate will be a healthier diet. And then you call it pescatarian, Mediterranean, any diet where your intake of carbohydrate and and, and, and and saturated fat, any diet that have an excess of saturated fat and carbohydrate will be a deleterious diet. So anything you can do to make your diet healthier will have direct uh, benefit in, in both how you age and, and how you avoid cancer. My wife is a, so I am from Argentina. I am from, I am from Argentina. We grow up eating a lot of red meat, uh, Asado, meat, isn't meat it? in general. And my wife is a vegetarian for, for many, many years. And when we moved to the States, actually one of the good things that came from, from moving to the state that, that it's much less common to eat that much red meat. And, and, and that combined with my wife at home trying to make us eat uh, healthier. So I, I won't say that I am vegetarian. I still eat red meat and, and steak here and there, but we definitely became much, much more aware of a healthier diet and, and, and the benefits of, of, if not a fully vegetarian uh, uh, diet, a, a, a strongly vegetarian diet because of all the, of the health benefits that come with it. Awesome. And if there's one decision that you make each day, you, you, diet, I think is a great one. How about exercise decision that you make each day? If there's a specific type of activity uh, that you give as a tip to our listeners. I don't have a good tip because I, so I do play tennis. This is my main exercise. I, with my twin brother, we've been playing tennis since we are five. So for the past almost 50 years, I was at 40 something years. Uh, I try to play tennis twice a week. The, and I said it's not probably a good advice because at my age, this is the most non-aerobic, <laughs> terrible type of exercise you can do to your knees. And, and we become very passionate when we play. So we end up hurting the, the knees and our arms. So we don't play in a healthy way. But, but <laughs> this is what I enjoy most. I wish... I could, my, my wife, it's a, it's a, she's a marathoner. She runs every day and, and I, I can't even start telling you the benefits of running long, long, long distances. Uh, marathoners, as you probably know, and I'm sure you, you have already interviewed in your podcast, some marathoners, uh, the benefits, they are always off scale. The marathoners, when, you, when people do metabolic studies in people, you have obese, you have normal healthy people and then the marathoners are always in, in, in just like like it is they are aliens on, on their metabolism so <laughs> the, the benefits of running i would say if i cap one advice will be try to run every day uh half an hour to an hour that will be the best you can do i i get bored running so i try to run a little but usually my main exercise is tennis but anything anything you do when that that, that will send you outside Outdoor more than indoor, it's definitely healthier. I wish in Boston we can do that year around outdoor activities. It's more difficult here in Boston, but uh, anything that you do as an exercise is good. Uh, anything that kick you out of the coach is, will be, it will be good. So, so Raul, uh, related to marathon, we are now writing a paper. We have a very big database. So we have like 15,000 uh, runners in our uh, database. And we looked at the uh, effect of running from an ultra marathon to someone that is a real couch potato, basically someone that is not running at all. And what we've seen, exactly as you said, a, a very strong correlation about how their blood biomarkers are better. So glucose and the LDL and the HDL and inflammation marker. Marathoners is amazing. And then when you run a bit less, it's a bit less good. And then when you run a bit less, it's a bit less good. 
and then when you get to the real couch potato, it's really bad. So I, I 100% agree with you. There is a very strong correlation between the amount of running that you do and the level of the metabolic-related marker that you see in the, the blood. I, I am not surprised, but it's nice that you did because we always try to show, give data for it, and there is not much data Correct. that what we empirically know. So I'm looking forward to seeing your paper. Uh, I am not surprised about those results. There is a, definitely a clear correlation, so it's nice that you... you You've been doing this in a systematic way. Maybe I should start running some other things. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today. I feel like we peppered you with so many questions. And thanks for all of your thoughtful answers. I definitely learned a ton. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to be part of the podcast. And yeah, I, we're happy to, to, to stay in touch. Awesome. And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientists. For more information, please go to www.insidetracker.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.